Hey there, web demons. It's your boy Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And today's episode is about transitions. And we're being a little matter of fact because this will be, for the foreseeable future, my last episode as co host of this amazing show. It has been an honor and a privilege to be part of this, but I have to look at my own mental health and my burnout, honestly with um which is a problem whenever you make your hobby your business and i think that's the biggest thing just um there is no ill will here there is nothing of that sort it is just a decision that i have made and um so yeah let's uh let's get on with this transition on today's web dm <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i fully support you man like you're, you're right there is a um there is a cost to coming to like turning what you love doing and, and what rejuvenated you and into work into business and yeah. you know it's it is completely uh you know valid to be like i you know you want that uh that hobby part back and i want mm -hmm. one of yours to know you're not leaving webdm you're just no, we're just you're not going to do the videos anymore. You're, there's other ways in which you're involved with uh, with us. Oh, most definitely. I mean, I'm absolutely love. I love writing this book uh, with y'all. Uh, it's mm. been and actually, it's one of the things that has brought into stark contrast, like mm. how much I love doing that, and then when it comes time to get ready for videos, how like I'm just kind of like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and it's yeah. and I, I yeah. can feel myself putting on my it's time to go to work jacket to go to sure. work. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, but no, I, I definitely going to be a part of writing, uh, when we do games, still going to be GMing some games here and playing on games and still popping in on the Patreon podcast, uh, as much as I can. Um, and who knows, maybe in six months or a year, it's like, no, I want to make puns again. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who knows? But, uh, yeah, well, but sometimes, you know, you, know, you got to uh... take the punny and run. No. That's true. That's for sure. <laughs> God damn. Yeah. Well, we fully Sorry. support you and anything you're doing to, to help with that and help ease the burden of burnout, uh, definitely support. And yeah, just let yeah. Our, our viewers know that those to be WebDM videos. We're taking a uh, short break. We'll be back after that. Um, and yeah, when you're welcome whenever you want back on the show. This episode is brought to you by Dungeon Fog, the online map maker and authoring tool for game masters. With this any award-winning tool, you can save yourself hours of time when you generate gorgeous maps, buildings, rooms, dungeons, and more. It's Dungeon Fog's fourth anniversary, and they've got some fantastic giveaways and events coming up next week. Don't miss it. There's never been a better time to try out Dungeon Fog and upgrade your map game. They've got free subscription and on-demand access options available. Check out Dungeon Fog, y'all. Use the link in the comments and description and get 10% off annual subscriptions. Come, coming, uh, bringing the segue around to today's yeah. subject, though, in transitions, because I think that this is a, it's an important stage in gaming. Uh, and there's multiple ways that we're going to be talking about this um, as far as transitions. But like starting out with basically connecting like story arcs and adventures like you know some people yeah. love taking all the 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 first adventures in D D and tethering them together um yeah. but but using a transition as a way to lay like a foundation or just like uh, uh setting an emo a tone whether mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. with the amount of action or the emotion or or whatever if you want to change the tone of the adventure from you know more action oriented to intrigue to intriguing and mysterious yeah. uh but but what are your thoughts on this, Jim, when it, when it comes to transitioning uh, your story arcs? Yeah, I mean, this was really my preferred way to run, like, modern versions of D&D, &D, where <clears throat> sort of, like, the character motivation, character goals is centric, and, like, spending time with the characters as they develop over time and perhaps exploring parts of their backstory through play uh, is, is important to players. And rather than having, like, one big, long arc... You know, the, the big bad guy yeah. is 20 levels away and you, you got to work there. I found that a series of smaller sort of, you know, nicely wrapped up in a bow uh, <laughs> with a conclusion and everything 
uh, adventures, which turn out to be synonymous with story arcs usually, um, are really satisfying because it gives you that that conclusion that that's very you know like gives you the warm fuzzies of like I accomplished my goal, this is wrapped up. But then the game doesn't yeah. end. You keep playing the same character, you know, and it's really fun. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it to me, it's kind of like having multiple seasons of the same television show. Like really mm -hmm. digging into that and getting that catharsis of a problem presented itself. We ran around and got the clues and the information we needed, and then we took care of it. All yeah. right, now let's get on to the next thing. Let's get on to the yeah. next book of our lives, uh, because. I find also sometimes when you do the big, long first one through 20 huge arc, you forget yeah. so much of those early adventures. And maybe it's some stuff that you need to remember to, to finish sure. off the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. shortening those things so, you know, that that information can stay relevant and fresh in the players minds uh, to me just helps, you know, bring out the most of the arc itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's something lost when you try to bite off more than you could chew. And like one of those things is, is a connection to the initial motivators or, or like the reason why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. But it could be information, you know, the, the significance of NPCs or events or something. But like you also miss what comes at the end, which is like getting to revel and savor the victory and getting to, to mm -hmm. see how it impacts the world and change. And, and you know, D&D &D conveniently is like, level based and has demarcated the levels into these neat little tiers that <laughs> can help you gauge like when it's appropriate to have an arc close mm -hmm. like what are some good like you know level markers that 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 after this level these sorts of threats aren't going to be nearly as uh you know exciting anymore so we want to make sure we get these yeah. in early or or this level range right so the, there's a lot of tools built into the game and other level based games uh, for this style of play but really, like to me, the big strength is that it does. The game is not over just because you finished an adventure book, and you know, like to stick with D and D, like most of the adventures end somewhere between eighth to fourteenth level or so, right? Like right around when you're about to get into tier three or hit that high tier two, and it's like there's a whole half of the game remaining, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, thinking in terms of how to keep it going with the same characters by building on prior events. Uh, taking whatever threads or, or, you know, plot hooks or whatever that, that didn't get resolved in that conclusion and bringing them forward to create a chain of continuity that links these individual arcs. And once you yeah. get good with, like, making the transition from the close of one, we, you know, we defeated the bad guy, we, we got the reward, we're, you know, we got the level, the gold, the whatever, you know, and, you know, now there's something else, that you can lose momentum there. There can be just too much <laughs> reveling in the victory and like there's no more problems to fix, no more conflicts to, to, to get involved in. And so if you lay that groundwork before the conclusion, that carries over so that you have both. You have mm -hmm. the, the satisfaction of seeing something resolved, of knowing that villain is not going to come back, that problem is, is done with, dealing with the consequences of that problem, and then other things that were introduced that are still in resolution so that over time yeah. you start juggling multiple arcs at the same time and you're braiding them together into a, into a campaign. Yeah. Cause there's nothing like uh, defeating the big bad guy at the bottom of the mines. And then you find that letter that's like my master, we've done it. And you're like, yeah. Oh shit, there's another level to this, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, seriously. And, and like, yeah. Even that, <laughs> go ahead. I was just going to say, like, the classic example of this from first edition was the Against the Giants that then led into um, the Descent into the Underdark, where it's like, hey, we're fighting some hill giants. And by the time we've, you know, created an uprising and overthrown this, uh, you know, group of hill giants, it looks like something else is going on. There's, there's fire giants involved, too? Frost giants? Well, who are these creatures? Who are the drow? Who are these creatures? What are they doing? What's this weird temple that we found in the fire giants, you know, layer? Like, these tunnels go places we've never thought possible before. And, like, just every time you think that you've concluded something, the, another onion layer is peeled away to reveal further adventure, another mastermind behind it. Like, it can get ridiculous, mm -hmm. but done well, and in a satisfying manner in ones that's foreshadowed but not like too far telegraphed or the opposite doesn't come out of the blue like it really keeps mm -hmm. the momentum going and and you get the best of both worlds with that uh, style of play oh most definitely uh 
And another thing that is uh, not telegraphed, but you see coming, is us telling you to go over to Patreon. Check out our podcast over there. Well over 200 to choose from uh, on various subjects, uh, running the gamut of role-playing. Uh, so check it out. Support us over there. And, uh, you know, you get something for your investment. Um, so n- next, uh, we want to talk about um, uh, the unexpected, the sudden. The This is um, like, say, you have, you know, a character that you, you, everybody's having a great time in there, and then you have a, a, a PC die. Yeah. Or you have some crazy happening to an NPC that the, the whole party loves and mm. is maybe is integral to the, to the plot at hand. Yeah. But, you know, Oops. D&D being what it is, <laughs> shit yeah. happens. Combat, you know? <laughs> combat can be dangerous. Despite rumors, combat can be dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah despite rumors to the contrary. Right. Yeah. Or you're, you NPCs know, you're, don't have death saves. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, your your villain eats it uh, before you're ready, you know, because players got tired of the monologue and, and you rolled initiative in combat with them. Like, this happens all the time. And, and you know, WebDM, we get questions about it. I see it, you know, just in my own ramblings on the Internet of, like, you know, either my players did X where X is something I wasn't expecting and that seriously changes things. Or like this, this uh, you know, key character was killed. You know, the paladin in the group was the one who supplied the motivation to go on the big damn quest. You know, or the wizard. Uh, you know, their their player has to leave. They can't make the game anymore. So the, the wizards got to leave. But like, we're 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 working on something for them right now. Like their their uh, you know backstory is in is in center stage in terms of like what's driving the campaign, and like. You yeah. ju- you're just going to have to deal with things like that in the course of a tabletop RPG because you don't know what's going to happen. You're playing to find out. And the more you try to like predetermine what happens, the harder it is to play the game. And so you're, you're just going to have to start like, <laughs> number one, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, if, if you know an NPC is really integral, really key, protect them with minions and you know projection spells that you know you know summon an illusory double to interact with the party or you know yeah. uh, cat's paw adamantium like plot armor <laughs> right yeah. yeah magic mouths <laughs> that kind of thing you know you got to protect them and and keep them insulated because player characters are dangerous to the health of npcs and it it's going to happen that you thought this bad guy was going to stick around for a while and lo and behold too many crits later they're they're dead and your whole campaign falls apart because the threat is no longer the threat. The players don't know what to do with, with their goals. And if you build in resiliency by having like factions instead of individuals, by having multiple threats at the same time that the players are having to prioritize their time to deal with them, not like so much that it's a chore, but just enough to keep them busy. That's how you can deal with some of these sudden turns and, and changes you know at least from the dm's perspective uh, with their npcs and and from the player's perspective if you have a player that suddenly dies that doesn't have to be the end in a game with actual planes of existence where you go when you die yeah. and spells to recall people from those planes or spells to go to those planes physically while still alive yeah you can just kind of take a detour a little bit uh, and it, it, it can be a whole different thing where uh hey our paladin died we need to go up to heaven to see if he really wants to stay there yeah or maybe yeah. we can bring him back he kind of seems to have some unfinished you know? business maybe <laughs> you know yeah. Like we're about. yeah and like this is a to me this is one of the uh, like real weak spots of the big damn quest you know first through 20 style of game or even like first through 10 or first through 15 style of game where you're you're dealing with the same threat and the 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 characters that are there in the beginning get the motivation and like if you have to introduce another character at some point into that and they weren't there at the founding you know the inciting uh event then you know you have to really Mm -hmm. work to to fit them in and like you can avoid that by having the motivation be more expansive like it's not about having been at this one event or an npc doing something to the players and and now the players are responding um you can have it be something that's that has multiple angles for motivation so is is the event that you've cooked up is it affecting a community somewhere is it affecting others who who are the people that are the bystanders of of this conflict that you've got and you want to provide motivation for new characters think like there's 
millions of ways to, <laughs> to, to think of this, but it requires you to like not have a one track mind about the conflicts in your game and to think of them in broader terms of this is something happening in the game world. The game world has multiple parts to it, any of which it can bring into play at any time. And if you think about your campaign that way, it's easier to deal with the unexpected. It's easier to deal with, mm -hmm. oh crap, the key character in this group, the one that's been the glue <laughs> since first level, just died and there's no way to get him back. What do I do? Well, there's, you know, thinking about it outside of that one character, who else might be motivated? Mm -hmm. What else might, you know, they want out of this? And how is this going to change the nature of the conflict without bringing it to an end? Uh, those are the questions mm -hmm. to ask yourself. I mean, I think Beer Fest gave us the exact answer. You just bring in a twin character yeah. who's the exact same that that person already told Listen, every, everything right. about the entire party about. So it's like he already knows them. Yeah. That, 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 so, <laughs> like, okay, I'll, I'll speak to this for a second. There's a reason why wills, right? Like, I will the next character X amount of my gold and magic items and things like that are exist in D&D. There's a reason why mm -hmm. X character junior or their cousin or their brother or sister or whatever is the next, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> character made because that player wants to keep that connection going. They want to keep the, the, it alive. Like I, I personally have experienced this with a pin dragon character who died like literally at the moment of glory with their attaining everything <laughs> they could want to be marshal of, of the county, to lead the armies in battle. Like it had been building up for, for in game years to this moment and they die and they not just die once, but on the redo, they died. Like, we were over here Oof. flipping through books, looking for every rule we could find to save the character. Found it, still died, right? Fate has decreed it. And that sense of longing, of loss, of like, wait a minute, I, I was doing stuff with Merlin. There was, the guy was going to be the marshal. Like, I got to start over with, admittedly, the character's son. But there's still a loss there. It's okay that the player wants to keep as yeah. much of that initial thing going as possible and as a dm switching back to D, &D i think it's all right yeah sure you can play your character's sibling you know sure you can have a bunch of stuff willed to you or you were their apprentice or you know you were always on the way here it just happens you know fictionally that there's a spot for you in the party got there too late you know <laughs> that kind of thing yeah yeah it's okay you're not writing a you know literary masterpiece you're playing D, &D. It, there's a lot that you can yeah do with just like talking it out with the players and accepting that this is kind of ridiculous but it keeps the game going most definitely <laughs> uh and our, and our last little uh section to uh to touch on is um uh, a version that I, I i enjoy uh which is uh when you do a campaign of just serialized arcs just yep. these smaller things that don't really connect to one another maybe loosely you could try to thread something over the course of yeah. the whole campaign Slice but it is line. still a way to kind of, yeah, but it's a way to keep those slices coming. You know, you don't have to eat the whole pizza to, to enjoy it. You can just have a slice of this and a slice of that. Yeah. And it's more of a buffet. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it keeps the game fresh because you can have the, you know, the, the series of conflicts that are more combat oriented. And then you can have, you know, parallel mm -hmm. to that, the series of conflicts that require more finesse and, and social skills from the characters to, to deal with. There's yeah. side quests, you know, goals that are long-term, you know, you have a characters that want to build something or, or make something, then, then those are things that come up only occasionally and, and either resolved quickly or it's okay that they're just in the background. And like without a central driving conflict, you still have this satisfying game of like, what we're experiencing here if this were a tv show are the continuing adventures of this band of misfits <laughs> you know as they yeah. carve out a name for themselves in this fantasy world by hijinks and and you know violence <laughs> you know that sounds like a D, D game to me and it's okay that there's not like one big bad it's okay that there's not one central conflict that everything runs around that it's all right that it's just a collection of bite-sized conflicts that some of them come to a conclusion some of them persist over time some bad guys come back some bad guys don't some good guys become bad guys some bad guys become good guys there's all kinds of things sometimes we're playing an investigation sometimes it's a dungeon crawl sometimes we're doing a high society party other times it's wilderness exploration like you're never stuck in a rut for too long and there's no like 
one thing you're always doing that keeps from getting repetitive. Now, it lacks a strong yeah. theme. It lacks a strong central conflict. But I find that campaigns that go for a long time and have a lot of longevity are, are much more multifaceted and, and uh, amorphous that way. They've got a lot of things going on in them. And um, that's how you keep a game going for a long time. Yeah, because uh, that, the thing is, is the longer you play a game, the more conflicts or tensions like amongst the party can arise. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can use those transitions to kind of, okay, well, because the paladin wanted that sword that the fighter got, <laughs> we can we can kind of pump up the, uh, you know, like now we're going to give the paladin a, a quest that they really need a sword like that. So how do they handle it? Yeah. Do, yeah. You know, like these are the things that you can do to not, not mess with your players, but like sometimes it's okay to have that party tension yeah. be the central conflict. If, yeah. if anything, Ted Lasso as a TV show has taught me that. So you don't need a big bad. Life is bad. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just dealing with the consequences and fallout and, and completing, you know, conflicting goals yeah. can sometimes be enough. Yeah. And if you're playing with the same yeah. people and the same characters over, those arise naturally and can be resolved in a way that ensures everything can continue. You can have intra party conflicts mm -hmm. because you know, this character wants to do this thing. The other character has a different opinion. Like there's no right answer. So the players can negotiate with it for themselves. They can play that out. And then there's always an opportunity to catch up later. You know, you can tell one player, yeah, right now it's not your spotlight time. You're not in the driver's seat of the campaign, but you will be soon. Just, you know, let's finish this and then we'll get to something else. And again, because you're always switching up where the, you know, what's driving the campaign, what's the conflict, like not randomly or chaotically, it's, you know, creating satisfying narratives out of them with a, you know, introduction, rising action, climax, resolution, all that good stuff. But you're letting it come. Unless you're in limbo. Sure, yeah. Brian, well, that's different. You know. Sorry. It's D&D, okay. come on. Um, <laughs> but you're letting it arise naturally out of the events of play and letting the players see which conflicts they're interested in and signal to you. And, you know, there's plenty that as a DM you'll leave by the side that you just pick up later or, you know, change yeah. something and introduce it somewhere else. Um, yeah, it's it's a... It's like very, it's very satisfying. It creates this very rich campaign world that will sustain another campaign after it, and so on. As long as you got players mm -hmm. and time to play, it'll keep going. Yeah, but yeah, players are always going to have a little unfinished business, and who knows? They'll come back later and finish it then. Sure. But, uh, yeah, always, always an opportunity to come back and play. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. So. Anyway, folks uh, out there, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, be sure to hit that uh, subscribe button and like and all the fun stuff for the algorithm. And uh, it is a, it has been a pleasure. And so uh, I wish you good gaming and see you down the road.